Hello, everybody. I'm Megan Torrey. I am the CEO of the World Affairs Council of Connecticut, joining you here tonight from Hartford, Connecticut, for this very special edition of our series with Jim Falk and World Now with Jim Falk. Tonight is a very special presentation with Dr. Alan Gelzo on our ancient faith, Lincoln, democracy, and the American experiment. I want to welcome everybody joining us. And before I throw the program over to Jim, I just want to remind you that we want this to be a very interactive session. So please put your questions in the Q&A box on your screen and please use the chat to interact with everybody joining us from around the country. This program is in partnership with the World Affairs Council of Santa Fe and all of the partners that you see on your screen. I have the pleasure of handing the program over to one of my favorite people, Jim Falk. Jim, take it away. Thank you, Megan. Um, it's always a pleasure to be with you, and I really appreciate this opportunity, especially on the evening when it is Lincoln's birthday, because as we know, he was born on February 12th in 1809. And to have one of America's most distinguished Lincoln scholars with us is indeed a privilege. Dr. Alan Gelso comes to us from Princeton University, where is the Thomas Smith Distinguished Research Scholar in the James Madison Program in American Ideals and Institutions. He's the author of 15 books on Lincoln in the Civil War period, and I almost hesitate to mention the title of some of his prior books, but I'm going to highlight two. Uh, Abraham Lincoln, Redeemer President, and Lincoln's Emanci Emancipation Proclamation, The End of Slavery in America. I note these two books because both won the Lincoln Prize and the Abraham Lincoln Institute Prize. And Dr. Gelzo has been the recipient three times of the Lincoln Prize. Now with some 15,000 books, imagine that, 15,000 books written to date about President Lincoln, I had to go to the internet and to Google and say, what are the top books? What are the top 10? And on practically every list I looked at, Dr. Gelzo's books were either at least one or probably in most cases, two on the top 10. Another interesting fact is that in 2010, he along with his, uh, his uh, associate at the time, Richard Dreyfus, were nominated for a Grammy Award for their BBC production on the Lincoln-Douglas debates. He is a do uh, uh, Dr. Gelzo is a graduate of the University of Pennsylvania where he received his master's and his doctorate and I guess it won't surprise any of us that he and his wife have a home in Gettysburg. Dr. Gelzo, thank you so much for being with us. And I apologize for being briefly on mute. You'd think I would know better by now. I make the mistake all the time myself. So I noticed that unlike your other books on Lincoln, this was really written more as an essay, less than perhaps a scholarly work that you've done in some of your other books. Almost everything else that I've written about Lincoln and, and about the Civil War has been narrative history, because in a, in a way, narrative is the meat and drink of, of historians in terms of style. <clears throat> this book is different because it's really a series of thematic essays. And the themes are all themes that grow out of the issue of democracy. It's a way of saying, can we understand what Lincoln thought democracy was and then break that down into its component parts and ask, what did Lincoln think on this particular aspect of democracy, on that particular aspect of democracy, and so on through each chapter of the book, and hope then to arrive somewhere near the end at a way of saying, this is what Lincoln suggests to us, that democracy is, and perhaps at the same moment also offer us a measure of consolation, of encouragement, of hope. That this thing called democracy has a lot of resilience. It has a lot of bounce to it. It can absorb a great deal of punishment. And even though we live in a time where there's a tremendous amount of anxiety in the air about democracy and its future, I think resorting to the example of Lincoln is one way, first of all, to understand that we have been through some really critical challenges to democracy in our past, but have come through them, have triumphed through them. Lincoln reminds us of that, particularly of our Civil War era, 
and I think also points us to a number of important aspects of democracy that we need to really focus on as we move and anticipate a future for democracy in America. So that's in large measure why the book has taken the shape that it has taken, not a narrative but an exploration, a consideration, an opening up of definitions so that we can learn a thing or two about democracy from this man, Lincoln, who I think has so much to teach us on the subject. When did you decide to write the book? Well, that's difficult to pinpoint. I think that these are questions that I have been turning over in my mind probably for a good 15 years or more. But the actual decision to do the book really only occurred some three years ago when I made a proposition about bringing a book like this together uh, to Alfred Knopf, my publisher. Mm -hmm. And the response was good. And I set to work on it along with a number of other projects. There's always something else in the works. Uh, but with this project, I wanted to bring this to fruition. And I think that there's almost a coincidence, but a happy coincidence that the book is brought out in February of an election year, when, as I say, there's a lot of anxiety in the atmosphere about our directions and our future. Indeed. You know, I, I noted, and I think it's amazing that you can get access to information just now, thanks, of course, to computers and artificial intelligence, et cetera, but that Lincoln mentioned democracy 137 times. And I looked up and saw that in President Biden's inaugural speech, he mentioned democracy 11 times more than any other time that it had been mentioned in an inaugural speech. Were you surprised that Lincoln did not mention democracy even more than he did? Well, yes and no. It, you would think that for someone who we hold up as an icon of democracy, he would be talking about it all the time. Mm -hmm. Well, in many respects, he was. But did that mean he felt it necessary to use the term? No, because he understood that he was on the same wavelength with a great many of the people he was speaking to. He didn't need to stop and define democracy. There were certain common assumptions about its primacy that Lincoln could take advantage of. So he didn't need to stop and say, well, here's a problem with this. Let me define this. After all, he's not, he's not a professor in a classroom who's going to give a quiz on it at the end. Uh, he is assuming that his audience knows, and not only knows what democracy is, but in fact wants it, wants it to flourish, wants it to be the way forward for America. So he doesn't feel a need to stop and offer definitions. Sometimes he doesn't even feel the need to use the word itself because he understands that this is the common ground on which he is standing with all other Americans of his day, whether they agreed with him or not. What did you mean when you said he just looked like democracy? We, we are so used to the figure of Abraham Lincoln. And you've, you've got some pictures of him behind you on, uh, on your shelves. I think so that's you, your book, by the way. Yeah, exactly. He's, he's, he's on the $5 bill. He's in the Lincoln Memorial. We've gotten so used to him that it doesn't strike us the way it struck people then. And if there is a word that sums him up, it's homely. I, I, I'm afraid there's not an easier way of describing. And he knew it himself. And his voice those, too, right? I mean, it was those, not the, a strong voice. Yeah, those those big cadaverous cheeks, um, the the rough, unruly hair, even even the one eye slightly out of focus with the other eye, not not cross eye, but just very slightly out of focus with the other eye, the mark above his brow where he had been kicked by a horse or a mule when he was a boy. Yeah, there, there, you look at it, and, and if you took the man as a whole, six feet, four inches tall, six feet, four inches was, was pretty extraordinary in Lincoln's day when average male height was approximately five foot eight. So he clearly towered over people. And it wasn't just that he was tall, it was the way he was tall, because his height was almost all in his legs. If he was, if he was sitting down, Jim, he would look to be about the same proportions as, as both of us. It was, it was when he stood up. Mm -hmm. He stood up, he just seemed to keep on going and going and going. And those enormous long legs of his made him 
looked like when he stood up like it like it was a jackknife unfolding so uh, when you when you met this man you your first impression was he looks very strange he looks so homely he looks as one person said when uh, they talked about lincoln's looks this was someone who knew lincoln in illinois he said when you first met lincoln the impression you had was of a rough intelligent farmer because to tell the truth he looked he looked like a scarecrow who who was a refugee from a cornfield uh, he was just not very impressive to look at we're used to it but the impression he made on people then really was where did they get this guy from and it and it wasn't just the looks per se his voice uh, our impression of lincoln you know from from movies and whatnot is that he he must have spoken in a oracular theatrical baritone he didn't uh, he he spoke in a fairly high-pitched tenor voice very reedy very narrow very penetrating. That's why he could be heard at great distances in the open air during those Lincoln-Douglas debates. But it, it wasn't a particularly musical sounding voice. And he had this, he had a very thick border state accent. You know, he's born in Kentucky. He's raised in Southern Indiana. And when he talked, it sounded really like something from the backwoods. Mm -hmm. And people, people remarked on this. Um, one New York visitor to Lincoln, George Templeton Strong, actually did this sort of phonetic rendering of Lincoln in, in Templeton Strong's diary. And he had gone to, Strong had gone to the White House. They, he was representing the United States Christian Commission. And hearing Lincoln, he was so struck by listening to the man that he actually creates this phonetic rendering. And it comes out something a little like this. It, this is supposed to be Lincoln. Well, I never cross a river until I come to it. <laughs> yeah, and you're thinking, what? What? No wonder one Illinois editor, after his election, threw his hands up in the air and said, who will write this ignorant man's state papers for him? That's amazing. <laughs> I mean, we look back and reflect... We'd, we'd, we'd love to know what did that what was that man saying by 1865 but in 1860 when people first met lincoln then the impression was this man seems like just some some county uh, courthouse lawyer he it's like some redneck and lincoln knew lincoln knew that people had that impression of him hmm. he, he made jokes about it and I guess he could use it to his advantage well, exactly, because that meant, and he knew what it meant, that they would underestimate him. Mm -hmm. And when they underestimated him, that was their downfall. Because as one of Lincoln's longtime legal associates out in Illinois said of Lincoln, any, anyone who took Abraham Lincoln for a simple-minded man would soon wake up with his back in a ditch. And there were a lot of people in that ditch. Well, I want to get to that in a second. Let me remind everybody, please put your questions in the Q&A box. Because I'm seeing some come into the chat and they're very long and it'll be very difficult for us to, to one, for me to read them and two, to get to them. Now, one of the things when you talk about images that we have of Lincoln is of him studying books with the candlelight. And you know, I, I wanted you to talk more about how he came to the study of law, and then we'll go from there to how important law was when we talk about democracy. Lincoln has less than a year of formal schooling. And that is part of what people generally know about Abraham Lincoln. He did not have serious educational advantages. He does not go to college. Uh, doesn't go to a law school. Uh, he learns to practice law the way a great many people learned the practice of law on the western side of the Appalachians uh, before the Civil War. And that was almost literally by serving as an apprentice to an already credentialed lawyer. So you'd read law. This is the phrase. You read law in somebody's office. And you you do the equivalent of what we'd call clerking for that lawyer today. And in the process, you would read textbooks from that lawyer's library 
principally you'd read Sir William Blackstone's uh, commentaries on the laws of England and some others. And you'd, you'd learn the law by observation. You'd learn the law by directed reading from a lawyer. You wouldn't go to school to get it. And when you reached a certain level of competency, learning to do basic legal documents out of a legal form book, for instance, Lincoln had one of those, uh, then you'd appear before the Bar Association of whether you're a town or state or county, and you'd be asked what would strike us as being a few random questions, and then you'd be licensed to practice law. And to us, that seems like a, a very loose-ended way of going at things, but it was actually no different than any other professional practice uh, in the West in the years before the Civil War. Uh, it begins to change over Lincoln's lifetime, but as Lincoln is growing into a 20-something, uh, this is the way that most people learn how to practice law. And that suited him because he, he had a very remarkably profound intellectual curiosity. He loved to read. He understood from very early on that books were the keys that unlocked the world. And he once made the comment that anybody who would loan him a book was his friend. He And so he, he reads, and not only does he read, he has, he has a remarkably retentive memory. So what he reads, he, he picks up and it stays with him. Uh, but some people sometimes have asked me, well, he, did he have a photographic memory? Well, maybe not quite photographic, but really a very good memory. He could read something once or twice and he would have it. Hmm. So he, he, he reads widely. He vacuums things up from so many different quarters and it stays with him. Now, I, I think a lot of the times we're tempted and, and, and sometimes we're paying a compliment to Lincoln. We're saying, well, Abe Lincoln was a simple man. Uh, he, he was not one of these well-read book lawyers. Well, actually, that's not true. Uh, the Lincoln Herndon Law Office, and, and I'm referring here to his longtime law partner, William Herndon, had probably more than about 200 books as a law library. That's pretty substantial. And, and tell years. us how many cases he handled, because he could have been, he didn't have to go into politics. He could no. have been a very oh, successful no, no. corporate attorney. <laughs> Oh, yeah. I mean, his law practice is enormous. Over, over a law career of approximately 24, 25 years, he handles something like 5,200 cases. Mm. And that, that is a lot. I mean, he's a trial lawyer, too. When I'm talking about cases, I'm not just talking about doing wills and estates and, and other kinds of paperwork jobs. Uh, he is in the courtroom. He is uh, pleading in front of juries. In one particular year in the 1850s, which is really the big year for his law practice, the big decade, rather, uh, in eight, I think it's 1853, 1854, he is attorney of record on something like 360 cases. And in, you do the division, and that's that's one significant jury trial every day and more of the calendar year so he has a a very big law practice he's very busy all the time hmm. and and he's a very hard worker at it he he's the sort of person who who gives a a law lecture for instance and this is this is a document that survives to us from the 1850s it's, it's a document of advice to lawyers about how to conduct their practice and he says, diligence is the most important thing. You, you sit down, if someone comes into your office, they have a case they want to talk about, sit down, write the declaration that day. Don't let anything go by. And he's got recommendations about how to do this, how to do that. Don't, he said, don't just rely on your eloquence in front of the jury. You're going to have to do the homework. You're going to have to do the discovery. You've got to know the ins and outs of the details of the case. Work, work, work is the main thing, he said, in a letter to an aspiring lawyer. So he's very diligent that way, and it shows up in the practice that he has and in the kind of income he derives well, from it. Well, let's talk about sort of the theoretical premise of the law, because as, as you write, he was not someone who, he never became a member of a church, although he was brought up in a very religious household. And I think you wrote, 
that to him, he really revered law in a sense that was his faith. That's the time. In a lot of I ways, can... Jim, in a lot of ways, you, you put your finger right on it. Uh, for him, for him, law had to be treated with a reverence that rose to the level of religion. And this shows up quite dramatically in one of his early political speeches in 18, 1838, uh, which was sometimes called the Lyceum speech because it was delivered to the Springfield, Illinois, Young Men's Lyceum. And he starts off by saying what everyone could see around them, and that is the year 1838 was a bad year for mayhem, for anarchy, for mobs, for lynchings. And Lincoln lays out, first of all, what the real threat of all this, this, this lawlessness is, and what a threat in particular it is to democratic government. And then he shifts and says, how should we regard law? We should regard it with reverence. We should regard it as a kind of political religion. Hmm. And it should, it should be taught, law, reverence for the law should be taught in our schools. It should be taught in colleges. It should be taught by mothers to their infants in their laps. And even if that means that sometimes you're encountering laws that you believe are wrong or unjust, nevertheless, it's important to show that reverence and respect for the laws. Yes, you can change them at some other point, but what you don't want to do is simply throw them to the winds and ignore them. Because if you do that, then you remove one of the principal props of a democracy. Because what, what else is democracy? But government according to reason, not according to impulse, not according to passion. Passion for him was a bad word. We sometimes use the word passion as though we, we were talking about someone's commitment to something. For Lincoln, and in Lincoln's day, the word passion did not mean, the word passion meant someone who was out of control. Well, he really saw law as a way to curb passion. Exactly. And if you curb passion, that is how you put the stiffening into democracy. Because democracy cannot survive by passion. Democracy needs to survive by reason. And the element of reason in a democracy is what is captured by law. Law is what makes democracy possible. Law is the scaffolding behind which democracy is constructed. And his summation in the Lyceum speech is that abiding by the laws, submission to the laws, reverence for the law, that, that is what we need because if we don't, and mayhem and chaos and anarchy prevail, then what you will get will be disgusted people who see no alternative except to call in some kind of authoritarian, some kind of general on a white horse, a Napoleon Bonaparte, a Caesar, an Alexander, and power then gets concentrated, and what you get is a despotism because people have been driven to desperation by the lawlessness. We have a number of questions. In fact, when I look at some of these, I think that um, we could take a whole hour on a few of them. But let me take one now from Tarek in Dallas that he hopes that we, he asks that we talk about why do we not have a democracy but a republic? Well, this is an interesting question because, strictly speaking, the, the questioner is right. We are a republic. We are not a democracy in the pure, strict sense of the term democracy. Democracy, of course, is a form of government that originates in, in classical Athens, in the golden age of Athens. And it refers to the fact that in Athens, the Athenian assembly governed the city of Athens. It was a face-to-face -face sort of thing, somewhere between 3,000 and 6,000 citizens of the city. And they conducted the business of the city themselves. Everybody who was a citizen of Athens could participate in the assembly. Everybody who was a citizen could be an officer elected by the assembly. The assembly could take certain officers and take them out of office and replace them. That kind of everyday, everybody into the pool democracy worked for Athens, but that was just one city. How do you take the fundamental principle of a democracy, that sovereignty, political sovereignty resides in the people, and how do you transfer that? Is it possible to transfer that? to a larger environment. That's where we get a republic. And this is what, what classical Rome was before it became an empire, before Caesar. 
And that is, yes, sovereignty resides in the people, but you're dealing with so many people that everyone just can't show up for everything. So what you do is you elect representatives. And hopefully the representatives whom you elect are people who have some wisdom, they have some knowledge, uh, they know how things operate, they have insight, empathy even. So you're going to elect the wisest and those representatives then conduct the government. Always, always accountable to the people, ultimately, but still, it's the representatives who are going to do the governing. That's a republic. Mm -hmm. Now, what the founders of the United States, in terms of its federal constitution, envisioned was a republic. Because we were, we were, we were too large, even, even at our very beginning, to have a sort of general democracy like, like Athens. So the, the composers of the constitution, are they really understand that what they're doing is they're creating a republic. And the Constitution is structured to create that system of representation. So we are a republic. But republics tend to exist on a spectrum. They exist on a spectrum from those which are more democratic to those which are less democratic mm -hmm. in the way they operate. You had ancient republics, let's say Renaissance Florence. That's a republic, but it's but it's a very oligarchic republic. It's not very democratic. But then you move along that spectrum and there are a number of republics which are very, very democratic in the way they operated. And the American Republic was one of those very democratic forms of a republic, something which gets recognized almost at once. I mean, even in the 1770s, the young Alexander Hamilton is talking yeah. about how the United States is a very democratic kind of republic. And that means by the time we get to Lincoln, people are using the term democracy and republic in America almost interchangeably. And when Alexis de Tocqueville comes to visit America and write his marvelous observations on American political life, he entitles it democracy in America because we were a republic. Yes, but we were a republic that was very democratic in the way that we operated interesting one of the areas that i've really been eager to talk with you about is majority minority rule because we have certainly seen that in our country over the last several months if not years and you know in in lincoln's view what was the appropriate balance and how have we gotten off track and there was this i'll, I'll, I'll just mention this where our audience hears it he wrote in a letter um uh, to his secretary, John Hay, we must settle this question now, whether in a free government, the minority has the right to break up the gov government whenever they choose. I turn it over to you. <laughs> yeah. to, to him, to Lincoln, the most important thing that a democracy can do is elections. What happens at elections? Do election has have any of us ever known an election where the vote was unanimous? Uh, usually, the places where votes are unanimous really aren't democracies. <laughs> they're, they're really Our illiberal democracy that we see now. I, I know, I know. So, uh, what what happens in an election? Well, you get a large number of people who vote one way and a smaller number of people who vote the other. It's a majority. It's a minority. What should happen then? Well. First off, he says, do not expect unanimity. It's never going to occur. What you're going to get, you're always going to get a majority and a minority. In a democracy, what you do is this. The majority, simply by virtue of being the majority, has the right to have its way, to have its policies implemented. However, the majority does not have the right to take the minority, stand it up against a barn wall and shoot it. The majority does not have the right simply because it has the the direction of policy to destroy a minority why why shouldn't why shouldn't a majority have that right humility because democracy is in a lot of ways an exercise in humility democracy is saying all right the majority has made a decision but the minority you know they might have a point as, as we see policies implemented, it might turn out the majority is wrong and the minority might turn out to have been right. And at that point, the minority persuades people 
to come around to its point of view, and at the next election, the minority becomes mm-hmm. the majority. At that point, that newly created majority, of course, does not despise the old-time minority. At the same time, though, while the majority has to have that respect for the minority, the minority has to have respect to the majority. It has to say, all right, we lost. The other side has won this particular issue or this particular point in policy. It is not our job to subvert that, to destroy that, to undermine that. We can disagree with it. We can continue to think and promote our viewpoint, but we cannot be destructive. Is that where, perhaps where, the, where we are now? In some respects, we have been at this point many times, more times, I think, than we suspect in our history, where minorities sometimes are so disgruntled that they say, we're not, we're not going to, to, uh, to play along. This was certainly the case in 1860. You come to a presidential election in November of 1860. Abraham Lincoln wins the election. Well, he wins the election, doesn't he? He wins it with only 39% of the popular vote. He wins a whopper of a victory in the Electoral College, but only 39% of the popular vote. And what happens then? You have the Southern states where slavery was legalized, simply saying, we lost the election. We're not going to live with that. We're We're not going to cooperate with that. We are going to take our bat and ball and go play in some other league or some other ballpark. We're going to secede from the union. We're not going to recognize the legitimacy of the majority. And for Lincoln, that is exactly what undermines democracy. That doesn't, that's, that's not respect for someone going off on their own and doing something contrary. That, that kind of disrespect is exactly what destroys democracies. And that's why he says to Hay, what is going on here is really a test of whether people are capable of governing themselves. Hmm. And I mean, understand the context in which he's saying that. In 1860, what was the United States in the environment of the world itself? Back in 1776, we declare independence, all men are created equal, we're a republic. And it looks like that's going to be the coming way of the future. And then in 1789, we seem to get a confirmation of that when the French Revolution takes place. And it looks like American Revolution 2.0, except that the French Revolution circles down, down, down into the reign of terror. Then it circles down to fur- still further into anarchy. And what do you get? You get Napoleon Bonaparte, mm-hmm. who's, 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 who's kind of the model for the modern dictator, the modern despot. And every every voice in Europe looked at that and said, oh, okay, I see what democracy gets us. It gets us Robespierre. It gets us the reign of terror. Hmm. In 1860, the United States is the only large-scale workable democracy in the world. And if the United States can't make it work, if the Americans can't make this democracy thing work. If the first time there's a great disagreement and a minority decides to walk out and pull the plug on things, then what does that say? It says that the kings and the princes and the dukes and the counts, the monarchs were right all along. And democracy is an illusion that will always self-destruct. Lincoln says that is what is at stake in this controversy over secession, which is very shortly going to blow up into civil war. Well, and that's what we're hearing now. Um, as other countries look at what's happening in, in, in our, the threats to our own democracy. Let's take this uh, question from Geraldo. Um, and it's a shift to talk about the economy, um, political economy, because right. you go into a great deal of detail about that. And this question says, Lincoln and the new Republican Party pushed an aggressive domestic agenda, including a national platform of tariffs and the creation of a federal currency. And uh, I, I, I just didn't, you know, I think about Eisenhower building the, the interstates. Yes. Well, Lincoln really had this vision about intercoastal waterways. Oh, he did. He did. I mean, very early in his career, even before he becomes a lawyer, uh, he offers to pilot a steamboat up the Sangamon River to where he was then working in New Salem. And why does he want to do that? 
because he wants to show that the Sangamon River is commercially viable for transporting goods uh, to the Illinois River and from there to the Mississippi River and then down the Mississippi to the great commercial entrepot of the North American continent, which was New Orleans. So Lincoln's involved in questions about the economy from, from very early on. And he believes, as Alexander Hamilton believed, as his model statesman, Henry Clay believed, that the best way for the American democracy to be able to defend itself against hostile monarchies and empires was to bulk up economically. Well, how do you bulk up economically? Well, you're going to do it basically by three ways. One is you're, you're going to develop infrastructure. And they called it in those days internal improvements, but it's infrastructure. Hmm. And sometimes it actually literally will be highways, maybe not you know, macadamized highways that we think of today with automobiles on them. That was Eisenhower and the interstate system, but certainly something that looks like a remote forerunner of that. But even more than that, canals, harbors, waterways of various sorts. He was a tremendous proponent of canal building because this would build the internal economy. It would help bring consumers and producers together because you have to understand in lincoln's day what what's the what's the fastest that people can move i mean when he's growing up in in illinois um coming to maturity there the fastest you can move is about 25 miles a day mm -hmm. you're, you're either walking or you're riding a horse or you're driving a wagon in about 25 miles a day so what what is a superior way of moving goods and that is by water. So you want to connect rivers. The way to connect rivers, you dig canals. How do you dig canals? How do you fund them? Well, this is where Lincoln steps forward and says, we need to have public-private partnerships to make mm. this happen. So infrastructure. Second thing, tariffs. You want to encourage American manufacturing. How can you, how can you do that when the British are dumping cheaply made goods on, on the American economy? Well, you, you, you protect and encourage American manufacturing through tariffs, and protective tariffs will boost the cost of cheap British imports to the point where Americans will conclude, all right, we won't buy those British goods, we'll buy native-made American goods. And what does that do? That, again, that helps to bulk up the American economy. And then and finally, what Lincoln backed was the idea of a national bank, just as Hamilton had in the 1790s. And when you say a national bank, we're not just thinking of a savings bank. We're thinking of an investment bank, a public-private partnership that would involve public money, but also involve private entrepreneurship and private development, where people who want to create large-scale businesses are able to go and find funding. And we had two versions of that. We had a first national bank that was devised by Hamilton. We had the second bank, Bank of the United States, uh, that had been presided over by Nicholas Biddle. And Lincoln advocated strongly, not only on behalf of a bank of the United States, but also of a state bank for Illinois, again, with a view of providing this kind of economic capitalization for the development uh, of not only the Illinois economy, but the American economy as a whole. Mm -hmm. And the thing, to keep, the thing to keep your eye on here, Jim, is that, all right, Lincoln advocates all these things when he is sitting as a member of the Illinois state legislature in the 1830s and 1840s, when he becomes president, we tend to think of his presidency as being completely consumed with the civil war, yeah. but he has a domestic agenda. And that was one of the questions we got was yeah. if there was not the civil war, what type of president, what would have been his agenda? And you're saying he had an agenda. He did. And the, what, and what does the agenda look like? <clears throat> no surprise. <clears throat> Infrastructure projects. He signs the bill for the single biggest government-assisted infrastructure project in the 19th century, and that is the Transcontinental Railroad. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, and that's important not only because of what it's able to do economically, it's also important politically because it helps to bind the Pacific Coast to the, to the East and to the Midwest. And lest you think that that's an inconsiderable um, uh, right. factor, uh, there, was, there was a lot of talk in the 1840s and the 1850s about the Pacific Coast going independent, setting itself up as its own republic. 
and, and there was a real danger to that. So a transcontinental railroad is going to reduce anybody's temptation to resort to that. All right, so infrastructure. He also is going to encourage tariffs. And during Lincoln's presidency, tariff protection in the American economy ascends to the highest levels it's ever had in American history. The overall average on tariff protection is something like 49%. And then, of course, he doesn't get what he probably would have wanted to get, and that is a third bank of the United States, but he comes relatively close to it with the National Banking Act. And the National Banking Act establishes a uniform United States currency, a paper currency, for the entire American economic system. We have about another 10 minutes, but we're going to go a bit longer tonight for those of you who would like to stay on because we have a treat I think the technology will work. We will be able to hear Aaron Copeland's uh, Lincoln portrait uh, narrated by, of course, Alan Gelso, and I think you'll enjoy that. So we'll start that at the top of at the top of the hour. Another question we have, which you could respond probably in two hours, is how did Lincoln struggle with the balance of the rule of law in prosecuting the Civil War? That That's from Jonah. That is an extremely important question. Yeah. Because on the one hand, you have Lincoln, especially in that Lyceum speech, talking about the importance of the rule of law. This is a man who spends his whole career as a lawyer. When he becomes president, people point at him and say, wait a minute, if he was serious about law, why are people being locked up? Why are there civil liberties violations? Why are the editors of newspapers being thrown in jail, which they were? And above all, why has President Lincoln suspended the writ of habeas corpus, which is probably the most important aspect of Anglo-American law in terms of the protection of the rights of those who have been accused and arrested and detained? And you look at that and you say, well, that must mean that Lincoln was utterly insincere about what he said about law. No, what it means is that Lincoln is dealing with a totally novel situation, which is a, a civil war. And, and there's, there's, there's no textbook for how to conduct a civil war. The Constitution doesn't have any provision, doesn't have any, there's no article in the Constitution that says, when the civil war breaks out, you do A, B, C, and D. Nothing like that. It, it, it calls for an improvisation, and improvisation often makes mistakes. Mm -hmm. And in the midst of civil war, without without guidance this way about how to do, how to conduct, when everything seems to be as catch as catch can. How is Lincoln going to conduct things? Well, people complain. They say there, there were massive civil liberties violations. And you, and you can point to some very celebrated ones. When you sit down and actually calculate the number of civilian arrests during the Civil War, they probably amount to somewhere between 13 and 14,000. In in a nation of 22 million, this is what the North, Northern population was during the Civil War, that is not exactly the gulag. And then you parse that 13 to 14,000. And then you find out that a very large number of those arrests were of smugglers, of the crews of blockade runners, many of them foreign nationals. You find that the bulk of these arrests occur in places like Kentucky and Missouri, where guerrilla warfare is rife. When you boil it down, maybe you can identify some 800 arrests and detentions uh, for, for strictly political matters. And even then, with these arrests, generally speaking, most people could be released almost at once if they would take an oath of loyalty to the United States. So Lincoln, yes, he does put some dents in the rule of law. I, I'm not going to try to tell you that he is a saint and that he walked on the Potomac. Uh, he does put some dents in the rule of law. What is remarkable is that in the unprecedented environment of the Civil War, it's only dents. That at the end of the day, the United States, when the war is over, goes right back into its original groove. If Lincoln really had been this great monster that some people want to define him as being, if he had really committed horrible, terrible, permanent crimes against American liberty, then, then 
what what magic powder was able to restore us in 1865 when the war ends to to our normal way of doing things well it's because we didn't need a magic powder that in fact the civil liberties violations were not of catastrophic nature and that lincoln never intended them to be of a permanent catastrophic nature they were improvisation improvisations they were bad improvisations and i and i don't hesitate to say they were bad improvisations and probably in many cases he could have done better. He does not always offer the best rationalizations for some of the decisions that he makes, but we can learn from that and we can learn from it and we can do even better than Abraham Lincoln did. Well, that, that's a good segue to a question we have here about how did the ideas from Lincoln about democracy and our affect our conversations and processes today are there things that we can learn from the Lincoln legacy? Uh, thank you, uh, Debney Stewart, for that question. I'd, I'd say that there's a number of things that have permanent communication with us today. For Lincoln, and this is the first thing, for Lincoln, the most important aspect of democracy, even more important than, than elections and majorities, is consent. Hmm. Well, I mean, fundamentally, what a democracy is about is the consent of the governed. I mean, this is what Jefferson says in the Declaration of Independence. Lincoln always said that he never had any ideas politically but that weren't ultimately connected to the Declaration of Independence. And in 1854, in a great speech he gives at Peoria, Illinois, he speaks of consent as the sheet anchor of American republicanism. In the one occasion in which he actually offers what you could call the definition of democracy, he says, as I would not be a slave, so I would not be a master. Mm -hmm. This expresses my idea of democracy. Well, what's he talking about? He's talking about consent. So the first thing that Lincoln would want us to learn and to understand about democracy is how vital the consent of the governed is, how seriously we need to take that notion of consent. That, gover that government in a democracy is, is the self-government of the people. It is their consent to being governed. Because as he once said, no man is so good that he has the, the right or the power to override some other man's consent to govern him. For him, that was in fact what made slavery utterly irreconcilable with democracy. All right, that's one thing, consent. Second thing, citizenship. For, for Lincoln, the, the highest title was, was the title of citizen. And for us today, I mean, there's so many different ways in which we can describe ourselves, but fundamentally what makes us what we are as Americans is the fact that we are citizens right. and we are all citizens. I, you know, I think one of the least well-appreciated provisions in the constitution it's a very brief one, but it simply says, there shall be no titles of nobility. No titles of nobility. That sounds kind of toothless, but when you reflect on it for a moment, it's powerful. It's very strong. It says, there are no the only title that an American has is citizen, and all Americans have it together. I do not want to close without people having a chance to hear how beautifully you write. Could you read uh, perhaps a, a paragraph or two and then I'm afraid we're gonna have, and then I do wanna set the stage for the Lincoln portrait, ask you to do that. I'll read what constitutes a final paragraph from the book because that actually brings me to that third thing about Lincoln and his message of democracy for us today. A Lincolnian democracy is a democracy which embodies Lincoln's own virtues, resilience, humility, persistence, work, and dignity. Through the example of Lincoln, democracy can claim to offer people not only order, but decency, even a kind of quiet, unostentatious grandeur. Even in its faults, then and now, democracy is still the best method for people to live lives free from domination and exploitation, at peace with themselves and with others, embodying, and these are Lincoln's words, 
a progressive improvement in the condition of all men and augmenting the happiness and value of life to all peoples of all colors everywhere. Lincoln then was not wrong to trust that our principle, however baffled or delayed, will finally triumph. Men will pass away, die, die politically and naturally. But the principle will live and live forever. And there would be neither slaves nor masters. Wonderfully said, wonderfully written. Can you take a minute and tell us about what it was like narrating the Lincoln portrait with the US military band? I, I love Lincoln portrait because as we were chatting beforehand, my first year in college, I was a music major. I wanted to be a composer. Only one problem, didn't really have all that much talent. <laughs> <laughs> some, things, some, some truths about your fate yourself you have to face up to but i've always had very deep musical interests you can see over my shoulder in the back one of those interests that's my old double bass um, so i've always had deep musical interests and you know, I, I love reading score and, and and taking music seriously the copeland lincoln portrait which copeland aaron copeland wrote in 1942 on special commission uh, is, is so to speak my solo piece because it's written for orchestra but also written for narrator reading Lincoln's own words and I did this for the very first time when I was a senior in high school and our high school orchestra performed it and our orchestra director Luca Del Negro beloved man uh, invited me to to be the narrator and I've narrated this with a number of orchestras uh, all over the country over the years uh, continue to love to do it if you're in charge of an orchestra, any of you out there, please let me know about it. I'd love to comment to Lincoln <laughs> with you. But on this on this one occasion in 2009 for the Lincoln Bicentennial, Mike Colburn, uh, who was then the director of the United States Marine Band, uh, invited me to come and narrate Lincoln Portrait with the U.S. Marine Band. And uh, that's what this performance is. Well, I want to thank uh, you, of course, Dr. Gelzo, for being with us and our sponsors, the World Affairs Council of Connecticut, Global Santa Fe, and the World Affairs Council of Dallas-Fort Worth. And uh, I hope that our audience will stay on and listen to the Lincoln Portrait. And if you do not yet have a copy of uh, uh, Alan's new book, rush out there and get it right now from your independent bookstore. Have a great evening. Enjoy the concert. Fellow citizens, we cannot escape history. That is what he said. That is what Abraham Lincoln said. Fellow citizens, we cannot escape history. We of this Congress and this administration will be remembered in spite of ourselves. No personal significance or insignificance can spare one or another of us. The fiery trial through which we pass will light us down in honor or dishonor to the latest generation. We, even we here, hold the power and bear the responsibility. was born in Kentucky, raised in Indiana, and lived in Illinois. And this is what he said. This is what Abe Lincoln said. The dogmas of the quiet past are inadequate to the stormy present. The occasion is piled high with difficulty, and we must rise with the occasion. 
As our case is new, so we must think anew and act anew. We must disenthrall ourselves, and then we shall save our country. When standing erect, he was six feet four inches tall, and this is what he said. He said, it is the eternal struggle between two principles, right and wrong, throughout the world. It is the same spirit that says, you toil and work and earn bread, and I'll eat it, no matter in what shape it comes whether from the mouth of a king who seeks to bestride the people of his own nation and live by the fruit of their labor, or from one race of men as an apology for enslaving another race, it is the same tyrannical principle. Lincoln was a quiet man. Abe Lincoln was a quiet and a melancholy man. But when he spoke of democracy, this is what he said. He said, as I would not be a slave, so I would not be a master. This expresses my idea of democracy. Whatever differs from this, to the extent of the difference is no democracy. Abraham Lincoln, 16th President of these United States, is everlasting in the memory of his countrymen. For on the battleground at Gettysburg, this is what he said. He said, that from these honored dead, we take increased devotion to that cause for which they gave the last full measure of devotion. That we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain. And that this nation, under God, shall have a new birth of freedom. And that government of the people by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. 